Dear colleagues, dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm very much honored to welcome you to the kickoff conference of the Microball project. About 150 persons registered for this webinar today, which is a huge success. It shows clearly that policymakers from all over the European higher education area are interested to learn more about the topic of micro-credentials. It was also our goal to open this conference only for BFUG members and representatives, officially nominated by the ministries and stakeholder organizations to take part in the dedicated working groups within this project. We had several requests from other interested people, for example, from universities, if they could join. But we really wanted to keep this project and the conference focused at national policy level. The Microball project will look into micro-credentials and their link to the Bologna Key Commitments. For those of you that are not directly involved in the Bologna process as such, I want to mention that since the Paris Ministerial Conference in 2018, we have focused on three key commitments within the Bologna process. The first one is quality assurance. The second one is recognition. And finally, the two Third one deals with qualifications frameworks and ECTS. Now, why do we need to focus on these micro-credentials? What are they? Are they something new? These are all questions we will try to answer during this webinar. Furthermore, tomorrow, during the kickoff of the three working groups related to these three key commitments, we will ask even more questions, more specific questions. But one thing is sure, Micro-credentials are there, and they can help to increase the access to continuous learning for all learners, regardless of age or experience. They can fill the gap between formal education leading to classic degrees and the fast-changing society and labor market needs, because there is a need to create new flexible ways of learning and teaching. During the last six months, we have, due to the corona crisis, learned in a very fast way to transform our classic higher education into online learning. We had to be flexible, innovative and creative. Micro-credentials in any form can help us. They can be offered through formal or informal uh, education and delivered through online or face-to-face -face courses. They can be organized by recognized higher education institutions, but as well by other providers, companies, for example. Now, how to deal with all of this? How to take up these short bits of learning into regular degrees? How to recognize them? How do we know if their quality is guaranteed? And how do they fit into our existing degree structures within the European higher education area? So many more questions to ask. Within this project, we will engage ministries and stakeholders involved in the Bologna follow-up group to explore whether and how the existing EHEA tools can be used or might need to be adapted to be applicable to micro-credentials. But first, we need to look into the wider picture. We need to look into the future of higher education. We need to dream about a higher education of the future. And we also need to look over the borders, also over the uh, European higher education area. Micro-credentials are popping up all over the world, and also our own European students might follow micro-credentials all around the world through on online education. So for our keynote, we invited Professor Bunde Tipakorn from Thailand. Maybe not a very obvious choice, you might think. However, I met Professor Tipakorn within the ASEM education process. The Asia-Europe meeting, or ASEM, was established in Bangkok, already in 1996. It is an informal intergovernmental forum for dialogue and cooperation between Asia and Europe, with 51 countries involved, of which many of your countries. And I always like to make the link between the Bologna process and the ASEM process, as many of the topics that we discuss in both fora are the same. And I believe we need to, need to take advantage of this cooperation in both processes to learn from each other. Professor Bunde Tipakorn has served more than 20 years as administrator and lecturer in computer engineering at King Mongkut University of Technology. 
When I got to know him, he was Deputy Secretary General for Higher Education Commission of Thailand. Later, he has been appointed advisor to the Deputy Minister of Education. He's actively involved in policy-related projects and activities. His, his interest mainly focuses on the area of higher education and teaching and learning in the 21st century. His ultimate goal of contribution to higher education development is to, to, to produce quality human resources. He believes it is the role of educators to pool resources and efforts to nurture the new generation, to be equipped with appropriate skills and attributes needed for the world of future work and to allow them with the opportunity for improvement of their quality of life and happiness. Therefore, I'm most happy to give him the floor now and let him explain to you how he sees the higher education of the future and more specifically, the micro-credentials in global context. Professor Bundit Tipakorn, the floor is yours. Okay. Okay. Now I think everything okay now. Okay. Uh, well, as I mentioned earlier, that my, my 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 talk will be more likely to focus on the future of higher education, especially to serve lifelong learning paradigm, especially for after the COVID nineteen, and it's also I'm looking for the higher education with not, which won't be the same in the future. Okay, uh, today education normally one person, a person will get the first job from associate uh, will will be educated or get the first degree from the college or some diploma, and then they will work, and then they will retire after 60 or more than 60. And this system, it seems to be work okay because if the world is not changing much, in the industrial world, everything changes so slow. So why are you working? Nothing much changing. So loading the people with the knowledge, make them to be knowledgeable, or scholar, it seemed to be okay for them to use the knowledge during their work. So this is a kind of system that everything built on constructing the knowledge. You build the curriculum, will be start from information to the known stuff. And then after that, it will be productivity and efficiency. So it's more likely to improve the society pretty much. And this thing is a fixed knowledge, it's a fixed mindset. Uh, higher education. So that the, the education that we see today will be a discrete education system. It will start from elementary, then secondary and tertiary. And then for the tertiary, it, they have higher education and the post-secondary. So because we build everything based on the constructive, uh, the, the constructing knowledge, so our credential is referred to degree, certificates, diploma that we got from uh, education institute. So school and college pretty much. 
So this way, the one that the thing that we see is more likely to be higher education is a mean to an end. And credential is more likely to reflect our uh, discarded knowledge. And it's a proxy to ability to work, but we seem to be it's okay in the old day. So this is a kind of a transcript will be a list of all courses that they take. It's assumed that if they, they, will, they will stop with so many knowledge that it will be useful for them to work. So I pretty much normally I call this one intellectual nutrition fact, something that, oh well, it's assumed that they have all intellectual enough to work. And but now everything changed. We are into the 21st century and knowledge is just one click away. So people can find knowledge anywhere. Just go to the computer and the internet. So this is to have a knowledge is not really important at this point of the time because, uh, because the people learning the new knowledge come up, the knowledge have lifetime, is a short lifetime. So when they learn the world changing, make, make the world changing. And then, so in the world at this moment, it's under something that we call VUCA. It's, the world is not, it's changing so often, everything is happened just only for the short period of time. That's the reason why it's so uncertain and everybody can, everything connect to the other thing, uh, everything. So it's more complex than it used to be. But the last one will be, it's so ambiguity. It can be either with this way, or if you look at the other way now, it can be the other thing. So like uh, information during this time, it can be interpreted as so many perspectives selective. So under the Buga chain always happen. And so in this case, it means that the rate of chain is very high. I think. So now it's moving from the Buga. Now it's moving the world to the digital era. Many people thought that digital era is mean that we use all the digital technology only using the digital technique or information technology, but is not true anymore. Digital era is really mean, you can see that this situation, I call this one digital era. When the COVID come in, they change everything. It changed everything in, for the whole world within a day or two days. So, now you are in the new normal, new situation, everything changed, career, job is changing. Everything changed within a day or two. It's, so, how, how, so this is what happened. This is a, this is a picture that I, 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 I simulate the way that this is what happened in the digital world. You see so many things change within a day, changing really fast. Or sometimes you say you see more than one thing change at the same time while you are living from a day to day. Uh, I'm sorry for that. It seemed to be slower than I thought. Okay. So it's the first picture. Now you see the interrupt, disrupting. And the second, it be, uh, it's the, sec the, the one on the bottom is like, you live in the so many things chain at the same time. So you have disrupting and each time disrupting is create a new normal. So it, what does it mean? It means that in the digital world, can, thing can happen very fast, suddenly happen, and then it's go to the new one. It's go to the new thing. So you will see new normal after this so many times. And the disrupting is not only for the technology. COVID is an example that disruption is come from the disease or some kind of phenomena happen to the world. So when you live in the world like this, how can you educate the people with 
How can you educate them to live or t r i p i n g into the digital world? Because you, how, how, what kind of knowledge you want to put it into the input in? What kind of knowledge you want to put it into the graduate? Or are you going to arm them with a different thing beside the knowledge? Okay, so this what happened at this moment. Job, many career gone. Now the new job is coming. So it's more likely to do something in the short term, in the short period of time. How can you make the education to respond for this kind of thing? Something that happened and then gone happened for the short period of time. It looked like something true. It's virtually true, but it's not true. Something like that. So it's a kind of thing that they move it from the discipline. Go to the something that is a new normal jobs. They have to perform perform a t kind of new normal job. So many of them will happen, and each one of them might need more than one discipline. So because of the job at this point is more likely to be t r a n d i s c i p l i n a r y We live in the world of unknown. And this thing is called the industrial 4.0. It's coming beside the VUCA. Now you have 4.0. Everyone, the 4.0, we have to connect with people to the process with the data and thing. The thing can think, can 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 understand only the data. So in the future world, people have to prepare the process that can gen the data in the appropriate way that the thing can understand. So I call this one is a world of connect everything all together. Okay, so it's connect all the thinking, left brain, right brain all together. It's connect between the computer brain and the human brain. So what kind of education is going to be in order to serve or to respond of all these requirement? So I think it's at this point. Knowing is not important, but how are you going to transform your knowledge to make to accomplish the the job? That is more important. So I think uh, course or or now higher education will rely on more competence instead of knowledge or the course courses to make people learn information, go to the unknown, make something innovation and. It's growth, so it's more like a growth mindset at this time. So if we jump from no uh, fixed mindset to the growth mindset, come on. So the curriculum will change to a structure of the competent to success to successfully t e a c h in the world of flux or the world, digital world. So as I mentioned earlier, it's Is about what the student can do with what they know, but the most important is in the unexpected situation. Not just only they know and then they can do it, but it's in the un unexpected situation. So this kind of thing, I, I I will say, higher education in the future will focus more on the competent, as we always said that. But how are we going to change higher education? What kind of the ecosystem? Of the higher higher education in the future is going to be definitely is not the same as the old one. Is when when we have to distinguish between normally when people say talk about what they can do, they always think like physical. Uh, I mean, more like a psycho model or specially uh, doing something with hand, but actually. For the higher education or the 2 1 s t especially for the 2 1 s t century, it's more like a habit of mind, something that controlled by mind, not hand. So when you said mind, it could it can be with the heart also. So you trick practice uh, practice come from particularly automatically. And so as I mentioned earlier, now you cannot just think of. The higher education anymore, you have to 
reset the whole thing. So what are you going to reset it to? But definitely this picture is not look the same now because in the digital world, during their work, our graduate work, they will see a lot of changing. So, and then after 60, they, they maybe still have to work. So in this case, it means that the education that load people, load with the knowledge or even competent for the first cycle of life might not be true anymore because they have to learn to, throughout their life or they have to, li to have the lifelong learning. So in this case is when, when you try to connect, when you try to, con uh, when you do with uh, the competence or now, I, I mean that now that we have to think, look at the credential in the different point of view because credential now is if it really transforming knowledge is a competent, it means that to be able to do something, it cannot be happen like a discrete system. So it has to be continuous. So in this case, it means that you have to train them from, the, from, from young all the way to when they, I mean, it's, it's all age. And I, I can say that. So now you have to connect. So education in the, in the future might not be ele elementary, secondary, and tertiary. It will be something different. But I think it's too soon to, to, to say what is it going to be. But at KVDT or my university that I work on, I'm working on, now we focus on lifelong KVDT, which we call that connecting learning to earning and returning for everyone at all age with micro credential. So what does it mean? It means that now at KMVDT, we have, it doesn't matter how old they are or how young they are, they can come to KMVDT to learn something, to educate, and then have some kind of the credential for them to work in a, at a certain job. So this is, a, uh, we use a micro credential to bridge the gap between the academic and the, the, the industry or the, sec the service sector. So we try to put our degree to be more transparent or in the explicit definition of the competent represent to, 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 to make the stakeholder can see it, see the value of this competent. That's the reason why we, we use a micro credential. And this is a picture look like each micro credential is finished in itself. And every time that you look at it, you see something out of the micro credential. As, as you can see that these two pictures, you look at the complete picture, doesn't matter left or right, you see the complete picture. But when you put this, all these picture, you stack them all together, you will see a different wheel or different picture. And I guess this might be something that we call credential. I'm not sure. Everything that I've talked today is just a, a thought. It might be true. It's just a, a, maybe a new normal, but it's not the, it's, it might not be the next normal. So at KMUT, it doesn't move now. Okay. Oop. I have to go back. But actually it's okay. This is, this is something that we try to compare between degree, MOOC course, and MC. Okay, you can see that MC is more likely to be just single competency or single competent and is, is, is going to be evidence-based and is a job related or is job worthy. It's not rely on the knowledge only. So it's a job, something that is, uh, is can be related to the job market and you build upon that. So in order to make them to be able to work, what kind of knowledge are you going to use? Maybe it's not just only from one discipline. And we call this one, so we create a platform to run the micro-credential. This platform is, we call that community for life. Yeah, 
this is I can skip this one. So we we unbundle everything from the old credential to be something that's smaller. And this one we got it from uh, the digital promise. When we start micro credential, we need someone to to share their experience. So we we connect to digital promise in US in order to, to, to get their expertise to come and then help us. So this is their definition, micro-credential. Uh, so you can see that it's a job embedded and performance based and is less expensive and less time consumer to study. And I give you another, it's small and stackable. And I, I will give you, this is another example for the definition of micro-credential from University of Buffalo. And it's stackable, uh, it's stackable. What does it mean? It means that it starts from micro-credential, it goes to the certificate and it can stackable to degree program. Or is, this is, might not be the, the only one answer. The, the stackable to me is more likely stackable to do a complicated job or is stackable to do something that is harder, something is very, very comprehensive. In the future, maybe no degree, no certificate. But at this point, you still have to link these two together. So, and then normally my co-credential will, the credential will come, some, will come with something that they call digital badge. Okay, digital badge is, is a digital icon that represents successful completion of the learning experience. So we also, so micro-credential, as I mentioned, is a growth of the student from learning. It's a growth of the student to perform a certain job. So it's an outcome, and it's, it, you have to make a student achieve each step. So I, I normally, I, 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 I example of the credential, normally it starts from engaging, growth, branching, and move on. So move on, when you make sure that they can move on, then you switch with a different micro-credential. So each micro-credential is like a having data about demand-driven, learning outcome, how can you are going to access their evidence, and the most really important is learning unit. And as the learning units can be so many methodology or activity, it really depends on what kind of credential you, you want to deliver. And because we are high education, I try to differentiate the micro-credential from training or from uh, it, it's a skill that using only the hand skill. So we, we try to make it because higher education you need high order of thinking. You need to accumulate the wisdom also, just not only the practice with hand, but it's got to be something with the higher knowledge. So when, when we said, well, when is the end of the each micro credential and what is different between micro credential and certificate? We think if they can do Proficient with if their level of doing thing by by mind, okay, uh, the the habit of mind. If they can do proficiently and unconscious competent, then we will use this one to. It means that they can get the digital badge. If they get from conscious action to proficiency, we will give them the certificate. Otherwise, we give them we not give them anything. So it what does it mean? It means that. Micro, our community micro credential, at least they have to be able to do a certain thing in a good way and they know how and they know why, not just only what. Okay, so uh, it's demand driven, evidence based assessment, self paced education, personalized research back, and job embedded, high order thinking, and other instrument of competency. Competence. So this is, we get rid of a time, it's no big time. Whatever they ready, they can move on. Okay, so this is what we build our system. They come in and then they, they show our evidence. If 
they, they have ability to get the micro credential, they can get it right away. Or if they don't, they, they, they cannot, they, they doesn't have, they're not capable enough, then they can learn from our KMT for life in order to, when they gain confidence, they will give uh, us the, the evidence so they can get the digital. So it means that they can be either earn or learn to earn the micro credential. So this is an ecosystem. We need to, we, we have designer, we have earner, and we also have a recognizer. The most important is how can we make recognizer the company, the, the industry, the service sector to be able to accept our micro credential. This is very important. So the designer, how are you going to design to make them be able to do a certain thing? And then how can you attractive the earner to come and get this micro credential or learn to get to earn the micro credential? So at this moment, the way that we do it, we have our original curriculum, we unbundle them to be each micro credential. And this one is, is an old system. When you finish all the micro credential, you get a degree, of course, because it's an old curriculum. And the other thing that uh, now for KMVT for our life or MC, you make the micro credential for them to be able to, to do a certain job. And then all these things link together with learning outcome. And we use the OBE to be underlying uh, doing everything in order to get quality assurance, quality control, and to make sure that everything is have a really high quality of effect. So this is what I mentioned. We have two routes for them. Route A coming as a regular school. B is uh, micro credential. So for the B. For the A, is regular uh, curriculum, and B, you take whatever you want to do. So they pick up what kind of job that they want to do, and then they go to the stack that we we put we put we we, we give them the loot that if you take all these things, it, what 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 are you going to end up with? And if you want the degree, how many micro credentials you have to take? So this is some the, something that we already built, but we will launch this one in January next year. Thank you very much. I think I, I, I learned all the time. So this is more likely to be the same picture. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Professor uh, Tipakun for this very inspiring speech. Are there any questions? So as explained in the beginning, you can raise questions in the Q&A. I don't see any questions for the moment. No, okay. Thank you very much, Professor Tipakun. Thank you. Let us have a look now um, to the question of what micro-credentials really are and what added value they bring. Elena Sirlan will bring us an overview for, of that. Um, she has uh, worked since the beginning of the project on the desk research study that you all received uh, together with the program. She is a policy and project officer in the Institutional Development Unit of the European uh, University Association where her work focuses mainly on quality assurance in higher education. She contributes to the management of EUA's institutional evaluation program and to the coordination of the annual European Quality Assurance Forum, ACAF. So Elena, you have the floor now. Thank you very much, Magali, for the introduction. And uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to our conference. Um, it's nice to see that we have quite many attendees even if I have just the screen in front of me, but as uh, Bundit said, we need to adapt uh, to the new reality. 
So um, indeed, my presentation today will focus on what are micro-credentials and what is the added value that these credentials bring. And uh, this presentation focuses on the findings that, uh, of the re this research that just now Magali mentioned about. Um, actually, in the course of our research, we found that, um, okay, it moved too fast. Okay, we found that the terms micro-credentials refers to both the learning activity leading to a credential and the credential itself. But this is not new. Actually, the same kind of um, referral is uh, for the bachelor degree and master's degree as well. Uh, then we looked also at the definitions that uh, uh, are given for micro-credentials and we found that there are certain characteristics that are described usually uh, in these uh, definitions. Uh, such characteristics are such as size and usually uh, the definitions say that micro-credentials are smaller than conventional degrees and the micro uh, part of the name refers to this characteristic. Then we have the purpose and uh, in some definitions the purpose is identified as uh, um, these credentials certifies achievement of certain skills and knowledge. Uh, then we have categorization and by categorization we mean that micro credentials may be categorized either as formal education units or non-formal. And then we have uh, types of short courses that these micro-credentials may encompass. Um, as for example, uh, I would give the definition uh, proposed by MicroHE project, where they give examples of uh, verified certificates as micro-credentials, uh, digital badges, uh, nano degrees, the micro-masters, and so on. Uh, and usually micro-credentials um, tend to be linked to digital. And uh, usually this term refers to, um, to the delivery, uh, to the mode of delivery of these credentials, to the um, uh, format of the credential, to its storage, uh, or sometimes it refers to all of these uh, parameters. And after we analyzed actually quite many uh, definitions uh, that are out there, we found that there is indeed no consensus on a definition at this point. And um, together with the partners and the experts of our project, uh, we uh, worked on a definition that would be applicable for uh, EHEA area that you see now on the screen. This is a working definition and um, for now, I would uh, want very much you to read it through. I won't read it aloud, uh, but read it carefully because afterwards I will uh, very much want you to ask uh, uh, to answer some questions that we have so that we gather your feedback on it. So while I leave you to read it through, I prepare the questions. All right. I hope you see my screen. So in order for you to be able to answer the, the questions, uh, okay, I received just now a All right, just one moment. I see that the, uh, the presentation is gone from the screen. Um, I wonder if you actually, yeah, just one. Okay. I will go back to the, uh, Jasper, I, I would ask you to go back one slide where we have the definition. Yes, this is the definition. And um, the code to connect on Mentimeter, so you use menti.com to go to the, uh, to the questions. And as Maria just now said, the code is 29576. So the one that we have also on the slide now on the screen. 
I will ask you to answer the question. So the first question is, would you add or delete anything from the definition? Okay, I see there is Mentimeter code not to be found. All right, all right, I see. Well, now we will adapt, of course, to the conditions. I see. Now, actually, I will send you another code. I see Mentimeter just now generated another one. I'm sorry for this. Uh, just one moment. All. Please see in the chat. I just added the new code, which is 7516151. The new code. Apparently, Mentimeter decided to change it. And I'm sorry for that. I hope now you can vote. I see votes coming. Very well. Very well. And as I said, so oh, you, you have the first question there. Would you add or delete anything from the definition? Good. So the code is working now. Very nice. I see we have answers coming in. I see. Okay. While they are coming in, I will move okay to the second question. You still can answer the first one. So go ahead and answer. The second question is what would you delete from the definition? So the same code should give you uh, access to the next question. And in order to answer this question, please fill in a keyword. You have there the option to fill in two keywords if you would like to do so. Uh, all right, I see them coming in as well. Very nice. After you will complete the questions, I will share with you the results, so don't worry. Okay, I see seven results for now we have there. Yes. The numbers are growing very nice. We have for now the biggest word on the word cloud is nothing. So it's a, it's a good sign. There is nothing to add to the definition. All right, then uh, while you answer, I will move to the third question, which is what detail or details would you add to the definition? So in case you consider that there is something to be added, please answer this question. Uh, the same as for the previous, you should just fill in a keyword. <laughs> okay. For now, again, we have nothing big on the screen, but I will show you in a moment so that you see it as well. Okay, more answers coming. Very nice. Very nice. Okay, let me see. How... Um, Okay, now I will share with you. Uh, I will share you with you the results so that you see what were the answers given. Please let me know if you see my screen. This is important. You shall see it now. Okay, share. Not yet. Okay, is it there? I hope it is there. Uh, for now, you see the answers. Okay, for now, you see the answers to the first question. So we have 29% of attendees answering yes, there is something to be added to the definition, and the other 71 say there is nothing to be added. Then, when I asked what would you delete from the definition, uh, there are some, so nothing, as I said, is the biggest. Then we see here specific, I guess the word specific. Um, uh, okay, limitation to he only. Aha, uh -huh, it's the limitation, okay, the limitation for higher education. Then we have simply simplify competencies. All right, good. And then for the third question, let's see what we've got. What details would you add to the definition? Again, we have uh, biggest nothing in this, on the screen. Then smallest amount of credit. What is meant by credenti? Uh, right, we see them moving. 
Uh, okay, definition of credential. Uh, all right, good. Thank you very much for your answers. They are definitely very useful for us. Uh, I will ask Jasper to again, so that we share the, the presentation, we return to it. Yes, again, thank you for your answers and I'm sorry for the little uh, technical problem. Um, and uh, apparently it was at the end successful. So we will take in account your feedback. And moving forward, actually in our study, we also looked at um, how, what are the, the different, um, let me see, my slide is not moving for now. Uh, all right, but well, yes, now it's moving, good. So we looked at different perspectives uh, when it comes to micro-credentials and um, in policymakers' perspective, when compared to conventional degree, micro-credentials are seen and are promoted as more focused, shorter, um, uh, more flexible, uh, flexible ways to answer to the needs of society and to the needs of labor market. And as such, they actually fulfill uh, the need for upskilling and reskilling and the need for flexible and inclusive, uh, inclusive learning paths. Then uh, in higher education institutions perspective, micro-credentials uh, offer a way to provide more targeted and specialized training. Um, and also this is compared to conventional degrees. They also help to increase the institution's visibility and reputation and to reach larger uh, geographical uh, territories and to attract um, students from different um, uh, from different groups um, then in addition uh, micro credentials help to increase institutions responsiveness to students and labor market needs as already said and to experiment with new pedagogies and new technologies uh, in learners perspective micro credentials tend to be very appealing because these uh, give them the possibility as an entry mechanism to a degree program. Uh, it is also a way to acquire interdisciplinary knowledge and skills, which help learners to be more competitive on the labor market uh, uh, field. And um, micro credentials offer a flexible way to organize their studies because uh, either they are, are given at evening hours uh, at the universities or other institutions, or they tend to be also given online, which also helps to, to flexibly arrange that around the, the working hours if the learners are working. And um, last, for learners actually, um, it is important to obtain a credential from a higher education institution and usually for micro credentials there are no uh, uh, rigid uh, or mandatory um, uh, entry or admission requirements which is easier for students to get, to get in and from employers perspective micro credentials help them to easier find the, the needed um, employees uh, because micro credentials uh, tend to be specific uh, in the uh, in some learning outcomes that the students uh, acquired um, and because uh, employers actually do not uh, tend to understand the um, learning outcomes or the skills that students earned in a conventional degree so this is why for them micro credentials sometimes tend to be more appealing and they, they may use them as uh, on-job training mechanism for their uh, employees. Uh, then of course, as for everything in the world, if there is good, there, is also, uh, there, there are also issues and constraints. And with these issues and constraints, we will try to deal with uh, during the microbial project. So we identified the following uh, ones lack of consensus on a definition as i already mentioned about then lack of clarity which leads to confusion for learners and employers and to explain that as i just said uh, employers um, 
tend to, to look at the, at the learning outcomes that the student acquired. And if those micro-credentials are not clear in what uh, learning outcomes the students uh, have after they completed the micro-credentials, then for employers, it's very difficult to understand what is the value of micro-credential, uh, what, what actually the student knows to do, uh, and what are the skills he or she acquired. And for learners, on the other hand, it's very difficult to navigate the market of micro-credentials when there is no information related to the skills and knowledge they would acquire. And mainly, it is difficult for those students that receive a little or no support um, in finding the right micro-credentials. Uh, for example, students from um, uh, low economic backgrounds or first-generation students uh, and uh, also the, the mature students encounter these problems. And last, I would conclude that um, micro-credentials as they are, they are not a new phenomenon and we shouldn't actually look at them as a new phenomenon because uh, badges, uh, awards, uh, certificates as well, um, have been existing for a long time. Now the difference is that they are issued digitally. So, but in, in, at the core, micro-credential remains to be something that uh, is existent for a long period. Then micro-credentials do not substitute but complement conventional higher education qualifications. This is very important for us to get, uh, to get it right, right from the start. Uh, because we will continue having discussions about this and this is a, an important conclusion to make. And of course, uh, as I already mentioned a couple of times during my presentation, a consensus on a definition is very much needed as it will bring um, clarity for students, for, for employers and for all other uh, stakeholders involved. Thank you very much for your attention. And um, I hand to Magali. All right. Yes, thank you very much, Elena, for learning us more about the definition and the outcomes of the desk research. And I see um, one question popping up. What do you think about using micro-credential student activities in students' organizations? Oh, that that's a, you that's can address? a good Yes, that's a good question. And actually, um, uh, there are such um, uh, activities within universities and uh, not only uh, in Europe, but uh, be uh, also behind Europe, behind its borders, uh, micro-credentials are used in, uni in student unions as well, because uh, there are uh, entrepreneurial related courses that are very useful for all students and sometimes they, they are organized by students and for students. So yes, that's a good idea and yeah, it's implemented in some countries. Any Thank other questions? Thank you. Um, no, I don't see any other questions. Uh, we see um, uh, one other question. Um, if micro-credentials are not a substitute to a traditional degree, what would a micro-master mean? Well, a micro-master actually is a definition and a, a product given by, um, I, if I'm not mistaken, is Coursera. Um, and they uh, trademarked this as their own product uh, so that they make a difference between all other products existing uh, on the market. Um, the difference is not very big, to be sincere. Um, it's, it's the name that makes it different at this point. Um, so yeah, that would be the answer. Okay, um, thank you, Elena. Maybe uh, yes, one last question. Uh, is there a lower limit for micro-credentials? Should we focus to a certain number of credits? Well, this is a, a question that actually during the group discussions uh, would uh, be more developed and uh, brought to light because this is something uh, all uh, we together should decide upon, upon the range of ECTS to be given to a micro-credential. But uh, uh, there are some ranges from three to five 
my uh, ECTS for a micro credential. So, and there are ranges that actually go beyond five. There are ranges that uh, put it at 10 uh, ECTS. So this is actually a one more um, factor that creates more uh, difficulty to understand what actually micro credentials are. Okay, thank you, Elena. I think we have to close yeah. here now. Okay. Um, the other uh, comments or questions that were still in the chat, we will gather them and um, take them on board for sure in next presentations today and also tomorrow during the working groups. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, um, we will move on to the next speaker. So um, not only within the Bologna process uh, and within this project, we started to discuss micro-credentials, but this topic is also very high on the agenda of the European Commission. Therefore, we are very happy to welcome Vanessa de Vie saint um, Vanessa is the head of unit in charge of higher education policies and program at the European Commission's Director General for Education, Youth, Sport and Culture. UNIT is a lead service for European policies on reform and transformation of higher education, the new European Universities Initiative, automatic mutual recognition of higher education qualifications, the creation of the EU student card and the higher education strand of Erasmus+. So Vanessa will explain to us how micro-credentials are taken up in the European policy agenda, which, which steps have already been taken and what will be the roadmap ahead. Thank you, uh, Vanessa. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Magali. Uh, we are very um, glad to be part of this uh, conference today. Uh, as you know, the Microball project that is uh, funded by the Erasmus Plus uh, program is a very important one. And as you say, it will feed our work uh, towards a European approach to micro credentials. This European approach to micro uh, credentials is um, actually a joint initiative from two European uh, commissioners and I don't manage to move the slides. Mm. Ah yes, so from Oops, two commissioners, um, Commissioner Gabriel in charge of uh, education on top of uh, research, youth and culture and uh, Commissioner Schmidt in charge of, uh, of jobs. So why is it important to act now at European level? Uh, Professor um, Bandit Pipakon explained it very well, the changing nature of work and the jobs of, of tomorrow in five, ten years time will be completely different from the jobs of, uh, of today. And of course, the European workforce needs to adapt to that and they have um, an increasing need to adapt their skills to this uh, new environment, to this new uh, reality. Um, and the trend, this trend is only um, expanding with the, the, the COVID-19 crisis, unfortunately. So there is, there is uh, a need. And for that, we believe not only vocational education training, but also higher education have a key role to play in providing this lifelong learning Learning, education and training and, and uh, the, the full degree structure is not necessarily fully adapted to these needs because what these people need are just-in-time skills development through short learning courses. Now for these outcomes of these short learning courses to be fully validated and recognized for further learning or for, or for jobs employment, micro-credentials can be very uh, instrumental and very useful for that. Now, as Elena explained very well just before, there is a lack of common definition and, uh, and, and a lack of transparency surrounding these short learning courses and, and micro-credentials. And this is where Europe could add value by finding a common agreement and a common and transparent definition an holistic one uh, uh, that would cover all the education training uh, sectors 
and that would facilitate together with a number of uh, policy uh, actions that would facilitate the validation recognition but also portability of these micro credentials when we mention portability we mean not only geographical portability throughout europe but also portability between different sectors of education training between for example vocational education training and higher education so if we move to the to the next slide i don't know if I'm, Tony can help me yes thanks a lot so this uh, european um uh, uh, agenda uh, towards this European approach to micro credentials is, uh, is a key priority on our new European policy agenda. It is part of the skills agenda that has been presented and, and released in, in June and it will be a key priority as well of the European education area that will be communicated in September this year where we will emphasize the key role of higher education and vocational education training to adapt for this more flexible way of uh, learning and, and teaching. And as Elena uh, said, uh, many of these short uh, courses leading to micro credentials are delivered online. So this will be uh, <clears throat> this will be of course reflected as well in the updated digital education action plan that will be presented uh, later on um, by the end of, uh, of September. So if we move to the, to the next uh, slide, thanks a lot. What can we do at European level to, to support this, this trend? First, to develop together with all the relevant stakeholders, together with all of you uh, today, to develop European standards for quality and transparency, but also to explore the inclusion of micro credentials in the qualification frameworks. And it's also important to make it easier for individuals then to be able to store and to share, to showcase uh, these, uh, these micro-credentials that they will have accumulated. And the new Euro Pass that has been released uh, last June will be very instrumental in that perspective. Now, when it comes to the, the specific objective for higher education, the objective when thinking about the future of higher education, is to further chap, shape mm -hmm. its lifelong learning dimension, to improve its access to a wider range of, uh, of students through more modern and flexible learning pathways. And higher education has a long history of quality assurance, so they have a key role to provide this quality framework of these micro uh, credentials. And with the CTS and, and other um, Bologna tools, uh, they will be instrumental to ensure recognition portability across, the, across Europe, but also across the wider European higher education area. So if we move to the next slide, thanks a lot. To help us to drive this agenda, we have set up a high education consultation group with uh, many of you, well, some of you taking part uh, in it, um, being uh, representatives from national authorities, from high education institutions, some of them being part of the European universities uh, alliances, quality assurance agencies have a key role on top of uh, uh, European stakeholder organizations such as NQA, EQA, uh, AUA, but also is you and uh, and yes and, and of course all of you today through the microball uh, project will contribute to this uh, to this agenda so we already had two meetings with this group we'll have another one the 16th of september and we aim uh, the aim of this group is to come up with a an holistic common uh, definition and a roadmap of actions actions at policy and program level, uh, at European level, so that we can facilitate uh, this progress uh, and this European approach to micro-credentials. Now, now, so what are the general expectations um, with this European approach to micro credentials? Is to be flexible and holistic, covering not only higher education but also vocational education and training, um, as well as the private sector, which has also uh, an increasing role in providing this. Um, 
these short learning courses, but here what we are looking at is how we can ensure closer cooperation between the private sector that can hire education to ensure quality, recognition, validation, and portability. For this, we need a widely accepted definition, and it is very interesting to see the definition that has been developed by the Micro Board Project, and this will feed into a um, a wider uh, holistic definition that can cover all, all the fields, no matter who provides this, uh, this uh, short learning courses leading to micro credentials. We need to reflect how we can ensure quality, trust, transparency, and portability. And here, the the, the work of this microbial project will be will be very very important uh, to see how the Bologna tools bit in terms of uh, um, quality frameworks, in terms of quality assurance or, or recognition, how they can they can uh, uh, contribute to this uh, to this important agenda. And Elena mentioned the importance of stackability of these micro credentials without replacing full degrees. Obviously, that's not the objective. It's only a complement to what uh, to what already exists, but uh, an important uh, complement. Now, this is the interim um, draft definition that this group of experts have come up with. It builds on the work of Microbo, but, uh, but not only. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the, the objective is to be holistic and covers uh, all different uh, uh, providers of these uh, of this, uh, micro, micro credentials. I will not read it loud, but you can, you can uh, look at it and we will share the, the slides with, uh, with all of you. And of course, please feel free to to comment on it during these um, two days uh, workshops. So that would be very useful. Now, um, we need as well, our objective is to come up with a roadmap of actions, be it from policy or program level. So for this, on top of this uh, uh, group, uh, high education group that I mentioned, and on top of the Microbola project, we are consulting uh, as well a wide range of, stock of stakeholders, including in terms of adult and vocational education and training, mm -hmm. the, the European Qualification Framework Advisory Group, and all this will lead uh, to um, important uh, policy and program initiatives to basically support all the providers of these uh, short uh, learning uh, courses leading to micro credentials to facilitate the take up uh, the the recognition and the quality on top of the portability now the way what is the way forward so as i said we will work towards uh, european policy uh, development on top of the communications that i mentioned before we are considering uh, presenting a recommendation specifically on micro credentials in the second half of next year building on all the consultations uh, that we will uh, organize and building on, on micro on the micro project as well as uh, other other projects we will work as well on the transformation agenda for higher education. Magali mentioned in her introduction that we need to think about the future of higher education, taking, taking the lessons from the COVID-19 crisis, and we will engage in a co-creation of this transformation agenda together with the wide higher education uh, community in the, in the coming months. And we will build as well on the VET Council recommendation that has been presented in June. So for, but to implement this, this policy, we need, to, we need to build on instruments and structures. And for that, I, I mentioned before the, the Euro Pass with the digitally signed credentials that are essential to be able to, to, to showcase and to share uh, these, uh, these learning outcomes. Uh, the European Student Card Initiative is also key uh, mm -hmm. for the students who will be and developing such a learning outcomes during their, their studies. And where the microbook project has a key role is to analyze, as Magali explained, the fit for purpose of the, of the current Bologna tools. How can they be used, but also how can they be maybe adapted uh, um, uh, where, where relevant? And when they are adapted, how 
can we support higher education institutions to make best use of them? Sometimes they are flexible enough to be used for micro credentials as well, but maybe the, 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 the higher education institutions or the vet organizations do not always know how to, how to use them uh, more concretely. So here, we would like to hear from you uh, today and, uh, and tomorrow. Danik Narik uh, have a key role as well. We can build on their expertise when it comes to the recognition of such learning outcomes and ECAR, uh, which is a very important uh, tool to ensure uh, transparency. Uh, of all uh, quality uh, assured uh, courses. And now it is important as well to drive this agenda to provide uh, financial support. And here, this will be a, a, a key priority for the future Erasmus program, the structure of funds as well. And Magali mentioned as well the European Universities Initiative that is supported both by the Erasmus and the Horizon Europe uh, uh, programs. And we're very happy that many of them, we have now uh, 41 European University alliances involving more than 280 higher education institutions across all parts of Europe. And many of them are actually working into developing such uh, micro, micro credentials and how they can be uh, quality assured and, uh, and recognized. So as you see, it's a very ambitious uh, agenda. Uh, and we need um, the support of all of you, of all your expertise to uh, make it right and to drive it in the right uh, direction. And for this, we can build, if we move to the next slide, we can build, thanks a lot, we can build on, on several Erasmus projects, not only the micro one, but here you can see a, a, a number of them. It's not an exhaustive list, but you, 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 you can click on the links and find more information uh, on them. So thanks a lot. Uh, we are really uh, looking forward to the uh, fruitful discussions uh, today and uh, tomorrow in the context of the microbial project. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Vanessa, um, for informing us on the different steps and actions uh, from the European Commission. Um, a few questions have popped up already in the chat. Um, one specifically on automatic recognition, um, but um, maybe before in going into this, I want to mention in general, um, for this kickoff conference, we are trying to gather more questions and already answer them. Um, so that will mainly be the work of, of uh, the working groups in the coming months. Um, so also during the desk research study, um, we try to take stock of everything that already exists and we are trying to look which questions do we have to ask ourselves um, on micro-credentials in this Bologna uh, context. Um, so I, please do not expect to give us all the answers yet today. This is not the aim of this kickoff conference. Um, so starting from tomorrow, um, specifically on these three key commit commitments, we will start discussing among all the experts on these topics. Now, there was one other question, Vanessa, for you uh, from Anna. Um, what would European standards for quality and transparency be? Something different and in addition to ESG and European transparency tools, she asks. Yes, uh, indeed, it will go beyond the ESGs, but building on the on the ESGs, and this is all the reflection that we are having currently with this uh, high education working group. Uh, so this European approach, if you want, is a is an holistic approach, providing a definition, but also uh, a common framework. Uh, for example, there were these questions: Should we have a minimum number of ECTS, a maximum? So the objective is to provide the, the answers, but in agreement with the wide higher education uh, community. And this framework should be supported as well, as well by policy uh, actions to facilitate its implementation and the take up by the wide higher education community. And this is what we have called this roadmap of action, which we need to be part of this European approach. Um, I cannot uh, mention uh, now today the, 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 this, uh, this roadmap map of action because it is under development, but we expect to be able to present it this, this autumn. 
and then it will be this this will be a roadmap if you want of initiatives to be taken and actions to be taken in the coming years this is not something that will happen from one day to 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 another uh, some will happen quicker than others and this this of course we need uh, the, the the knowledge and the expertise of uh, of uh, of many of you to help us to 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 devise this uh, this roadmap of actions so for Vanessa? example uh, how the bologna tools can contribute do they need to be adapted how etc will be part of this reflection thank you vanessa there's another interesting question um, you mentioned that European approach for micro-credentials should be applic applicable to uh, the different educational sectors. Does this imply that micro-credentials organized by non-education actors, for example companies or civil society organizations, will not be included in the EU's understanding of a micro-credential? No, they will actually. Um, as I explained, the objective is to have a, a holistic approach uh, covering all kinds of different providers for these uh, short uh, learning courses, be it from the private sector, be it from the vocational education training, be it from higher education. Now, when we discussed in the last meeting with the uh, expert group, uh, of course, quality is, is at the core of this discussion, how to ensure quality of such learning courses. It's, it's, it's clear that higher education has a much more um, a longer history of practice and already tools and instruments to ensure quality that could be beneficial, for example, for private sector. What, what uh, some experts um, brought was that first, higher education has a key role to play, but may not have all the capacity to provide all the needs, which is why uh, um, the, the role of the private sector can be uh, very instrumental from that perspective to bring this, this capacity and the complementary knowledge and, and competencies, but at the same time, a strong cooperation between these different actors will be key to ensure the, 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 to ensure the quality. Now, how to foster this cooperation? This is what we are discussing with the, with the expert group. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Um, there are a few other questions, but uh, considering the time, I think we'll have to uh, give people the time for a small coffee break now. Uh, we'll take up the other questions um, still uh, today or tomorrow during the working group. So thank you very much. Thank um, you. We will Thank you. We'll have a coffee break and meet here again at um, 11 o'clock. Your uh, hosts after the coffee break will be um, my colleague Maria Kelo from Enqua, our partner in the project. So she will welcome you again at 11 o'clock. So, hello and uh, welcome back from your very brief coffee break. Uh, my name is Maria Kelo. I'm the director of ENQUA, which is the European Association for Quality Assurance in Higher Education. ENQUA is also a partner in this microball project. As you've seen, quality assurance is very important uh, part of uh, elaborating the micro-credentials uh, framework further for Europe. So I'm going to moderate the second uh, part of today's um, session. Uh, and uh, in the first uh, hour we will have now, we'll have three brief presentations by three individuals coming from a bit of different backgrounds. And the idea of this session is to give a kind of a snapshot or an idea of existing projects, existing definitions, existing use of micro-credentials. Because like, uh, like uh, Elena was already saying a bit earlier, this is not a new phenomenon, but it has helped somehow gained a lot of political importance uh, in the past uh, couple of years. Um, and therefore we have to kind of pick up and learn from what has already been done for, for a, a while now. So that is the idea of this first session. I have three speakers for this hour. Uh, and I will start with, um, with Anthony Camilleri. Uh, Anthony is a tertiary education policy consultant and the founder of the Knowledge Innovation Center. Anthony has a lot of experience in, in higher education policy, uh, more than 15 years or so. 
and he's worked a lot in the fields of quality assurance, uh, innovation, e-learning, uh, and of course also micro-credentials, and he's pioneered the first European masterclass on micro-credentials as well about a year ago. So he's well placed, uh, he's also the leader of the micro-HE project, um, which is just now uh, coming to an end, uh, and so he's well placed to, to, to talk about this topic to you now. So Anthony, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, to uh, start off, let's take a look at the Bologna process in which all of this is uh, focused. And Bologna for the last 25 years has focused on portability and transparency of qualifications. And to a large extent within a Bologna context, qualifications have been the unit of measure. They can be defined as blocks of 60 to 140 CTS. We have transparency tools for them in terms of diploma supplements. And typically, qualifications have been divided into modules. Now, modules don't really have a function except as a building block for a qualification. And within a qualification, there is no standardized way to describe them. They generally not transferred on an individual module level, uh, but we do have some type of transfer arrangements within Erasmus agreements or RPL arrangements. Uh, the way we measure modules and the way we measure workload and so on is with a system called VCTS, which everyone is familiar with. Um, the point, however, of this slide is ECTS and modules, the way they are designed at the moment, are very, very much in the service of their primary function as a building block of degrees. And if we look at the way education is developing globally, not only within higher education, but outside higher education, we are finding increasing commentaries that degrees in terms of a three, four or five year intensive period on one subject are not necessarily fit for purpose. And the unbundling of higher education changes in the labour market are leading to radical flexibility within some areas, especially fast moving areas such as IT. Um, one example of this, which I have on the screen, Google recently launched a program called Google Career Certificates. They are six month courses done mainly online. And once you have completed the six month course, you are given access to a position which would typically require a four year degree with a number of employers in, let's say, the silicon, tele, the silicon technological uh, professions area. Um, so, in our projects, micro HE and OE Pass, we tried to take a look at this phenomenon and what it means for educational institutions. Our definition of micro credentials involves that they need to be modular, stackable, portable, digital, and universal. Uh, what we're really talking about here, though, is that micro credentials are about being having a system of interoperable building blocks and that those interoperable building blocks don't necessarily exist within a single institution, but rather they're a system of building blocks that allow you to put together educations taken in different contexts, at different times in your life, from different institutions, from different countries, from different types of experiences. And to do this, we decided that to look at this holistically, we needed to understand four different areas. We needed to understand the prevalence of micro-credentials, what is happening in the wild now. We needed to look at both quality standards and technology standards for them. We felt we needed to assess the feasibility of using technology to manage micro-credentials, and we felt that we needed to forecast the impact of micro-credentials uh, on higher education institutions moving forward. We did this with a diverse group of partners that involved higher education institutions, uh, specialized consultancies in education, as well as associations representing different types of e-learning actors. And our results showed us that in terms of prevalence of micro-credentials, 
what we found is that many institutions do offer types of micro-credentials, but they generally don't think of them as micro-credentials. So when asked point blank, can you give me an example of a micro-credential in your institution, institutions were a little bit hesitant until the uh, concept was explained to them. Um, we also found that even if institutions are offering micro-credentials, they're, they're generally being done as part of their social outreach or as experiments. In most cases, the business model is missing and there is a considerable share of institutions that currently do not have plans to develop the micro-credentials business model. When asked about uh, what would be needed to increase the prevalence of micro-credentials, what we found was a little bit of a chicken and egg problem in that uh, most institutions told us that a lack of recognition mechanisms would lead to an increased intention to adopt micro-credentials. But on the other hand, we are finding that there's a lack of recognition because there is a lack of micro-credentials in a standardized format on the market. Aside from understanding prevalence, we also try to look at the issue of quality assurance of credentials. And what we found is that within a known and trusted system, we already have a very well established quality assurance system in the form of the European standards and guidelines. But once you widen micro credentials beyond having modules within a single institution, you need to find ways to allow the transactions between those institutions to happen in a trusted way. Which means that the concept of quality assurance needs to expand to take on a couple more concepts. The first of these is what we call quality assurance of the envelope or of the actual physical or technologically based credential which is being used. On this, there are global standards such as W3C verifiable credentials, the interoperable learning record from the US, but there's no European set of principles about what this should look like. The second problem is the QA of the recognition process. We have standards for recognition, we have bodies for recognition, but nowhere in our quality assurance criteria do we ask how easy is it to recognize a specific credential when compared to other credentials. So we, feel, we felt that it would be important to introduce these concepts if we're going to have a working micro-credential system. The second part from the standards is understanding what is inside a micro-credential. And simply enough, the Bologna process shows us the way to how to do this through the use of learning passports at qualifications level. So simply enough, we propose the idea of a learning passport based on the diploma supplement at Annex 6 of the EQF, but that instead of applying this at the level of the degree, it be applied at the level of a credential. Our preference would be that this would not be considered a supplement, but that this would be considered the default format for a credential, a digital document with a set of learning outcomes, information about the institution and information about the learner. When we take this forward, uh, we then think about how this could be applied into technology standards. And those technology standards from the micro AG and OE Pass projects together have actually been integrated into the Europass learning model and have become part of the Europass digital credentials model. To see if uh, this model could be applied in practice and if we could create a system to exchange micro credentials between institutions and have them recognized. We also, within the project, built a technology demonstrator. If you'd like to play with the demonstrator, you can access it via credentify.eu. And what in particular it allows you to do, it allows users to collect micro-credentials from different institutions, save them in the same wallet, and then ask an institution to recognize those credentials in the form of macro-credentials, such as module certifications or even degree certifications, based on experience collected from a collection of institutions. The last part of our project has been about forecasting and understanding the impact all of this will have on higher education institutions. We've tried to look at four areas of forecasting, which uh, new learning paradigms, synergies between higher education and employment, the effects this will have of recognition, as well as overall societal impact. 
It's important to mention that all of this is being driven by a mix of societal and technological factors. Uh, but because of time, I will dive straight into the five possible futures. Now, what we've done to be able to triangulate these futures is that we have actually used two different study methodologies with two different groups of experts. With the first, we used uh, traditional scenario building methodologies, while with the second, we used Delphi methodologies with the idea to see if different groups of experts on different methodologies would come to any consensus. To our surprise, the consensus was nearly perfect between the two groups, and that led us to five possible impacts for higher education. The first one we call a global micro-credential marketplace. And simply enough, under this model, you have higher education institutions, private actors, employers, media companies, and all sorts of other actors, all offering micro-credentials online versus various portals. The user is spoiled for choice and just combines different credentials from different online sources and presents these to employers. The model is entirely user-led and higher education institutions become one of many, many actors in a global marketplace. The second way we see this uh, uh, working out is the European approach to micro-credentials. And here we would imagine the, a European body, such as the European Commission, creating a European marketplace where educational content could be accessed in different language and particularly where micro-credentials would come from institutions that are understood to be accredited in a European context. Overall access to higher education is improved because people have more access to more types of content and quality is assured as well through an alignment with European standards. The third scenario we envisage is what we call lifelong microlearning across education and employment. And what we see here is that the distinction between degree granting higher education and continuing professional education becomes blurry. And we imagine people having career pathways where they choose to create a skill map. They develop certain skills within higher education. They develop certain skills in the workplace. Maybe they come back to higher education. Maybe they go to vocational education and they continue learning throughout life, but on a skill model in which higher education is uh, one of the two parts of a hybrid academic professional provision. Our fourth scenario is HEIs as gatekeepers. And here we imagine that higher education institutions see micro-credentials as the next big thing, but that they also use their current market power to regulate the sector. We imagine that higher education institutions act as the guardians of quality and that they provide access to other people for micro-credentials through portals and through networks which are run by the higher education institutions themselves. We already have examples of such HEI gatekeepers model. Coursera and edX and some of the other marketplaces do already follow this HEI gatekeepers model. And one final model here is the ivory tower model. And here we see a model where higher education institutions basically say micro-credentials are interesting, but they are not the job of higher education institutions. We're going to keep offering three, four, five year degrees and keep doing what we do best. In such a model, what our experts tell us is we imagine that employment pathways would become segmented. And you would see that certain professions would keep asking for university degrees and for certain professions, university degrees would become the default. While for other professions, in particular fast moving ones, uh, such as IT, such as engineering, et cetera, uh, micro-credentials and other type of private sector certifications would become increasingly prevalent or possibly even become the default. And effectively, you would have the higher education model, the vocational education model, and the uh, offered by employers private education model existing as separate lanes. Uh, the question I would ask all of you to consider in the conference is where do we want to go? Um, we see elements of all five of these models evolving naturally. And the question we need to ask ourselves is which is most beneficial for our end users? Which is most beneficial for learners? Which is most beneficial for our societies? And how can we make that happen? Thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to answer any questions. 
Uh, thank you very much, Anthony. Uh, now we have a few minutes for some questions that uh, I don't see in the question answer uh, chat, let's say. But um, there are some in the chat. Uh, one is, for example, when considering the stackability, Anthony, uh, how can we identify within the European qualifications framework at what level does a micro credential fall? Can it be stackable into a level five, six, or seven certificate or degree? I mean, uh, we've put a fair amount of uh, thought into this uh, problem with the European Qualifications Framework. And uh, what we can say is that a micro-credential can stay at a certain level of the Qualifications Framework if we associate that micro-credential to a subject. Uh, what do I mean here? Let's take an example we like to use of an, a course in introductory Japanese. That might be part of a level three or level four Japanese course, or it might be part of a level seven master's in international business. So if we just say that introductory Japanese is level seven, that doesn't mean anything. But if we say that within the domain of international business, it's level seven, or within the domain of languages, this is considered a level three, then we can do some mapping to the EQF. Thanks very much. Yes, I think that is a really interesting question that we have to very carefully assess when we think about um, the stackability of these blocks, so to say. Okay, everybody's very convinced. I, I'm not sure if you're all uh, 137 people uh, kind of sleep, asleep, half asleep, uh, but you know, please keep your questions coming and engage also in the chat. Sometimes that's a very good forum for you to exchange experiences uh, in parallel with, with the presentations. So thanks again, um, Anthony, uh, and we are ready to move on to the next speaker in this slot, who is uh, George Ubax. Uh, George is the Managing Director of EADTU, the European Association of Distance Teaching University, which is the European Association of all the universities dealing with online, open, flexible higher education particularly. Um, and uh, George has a lot of experience, obviously, on, on the field of uh, e-learning. Um, he is a coordinator of the European MOOC Consortium and also represents the common micro-credential framework and the e-excellence movement in terms of quality assurance in online, open and flexible education and has been involved in a lot of different projects on these kind of topics. So it is about the common micro-credential framework that we have invited George to present to you today. So I'm happy to give the floor to George now. Please go ahead. Thanks, uh, Maria. Just trying to get my video going. Um, but that is arranged centrally, I see. Okay. So I can't put on my video myself. Um, first of all, I want to thank um, uh, also the Microbot team and Elena. I'll actually give them compliments about the, uh, the first version of the, um, the Microbot draft. I think it's really, really, really good uh, starting document in which we can agree on. Yeah, I think now something's working. Okay, I don't see the slides anymore. And I also think we don't actually see you, George. No. Well, I'm sharing my camera, but I don't see the slides and myself. Otherwise, I prefer to have the slides just back on and then... Excuse me, Jasper, do you have some advice on this, please? Okay, now we can see the slides well, George. So if you're not able to put your camera on, we'll just hear your lovely voice and look at the slides. Uh, yeah, the problem is I can't see the slides. <laughs> okay, okay. Mm -hmm. the beginning. Hello, George, are you there?
apologies, we seem to have a bit of a technical hiccup here. I hope my colleagues, yeah. yes, okay, you're back, your voice is back. Yeah. Can you see the slides now, George? Yes, I can see them now. Okay, yeah. okay, let's go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Gary. Um, so let me start. It's uh, um, just want to set the context here of how we have been working on the um, micro credentials. As you can imagine, that uh, the MOOC providers are also very interested in micro credentials as they offer a lot of online uh, courses and, and programs. And um, the European MOOC Consortium, uh, we have founded uh, some two years ago with the goal of uh, sharing expertise between the European um, uh, MOOC platforms, uh, also their business models, and also the cooperation on further innovation on education, because uh, they didn't have as, as, a, as strong as a voice as uh, edX, for example, has or Coursera. So with EMC, we try to, um, to, uh, to bring them together and make a shared agenda. Also, uh, increasing the impact of European MOOCs by offering together more than 3,000 MOOCs in Europe, uh, representing also more than 400 higher education institutions in, in Europe and five different languages. One of the, um, and I'm trying to get to the next slide. Yeah, one of the uh, most important uh, collaborations is also the, um, the collaboration on uh, labor market approaches. So we exchange also with the European MOOC Consortium ways of how to, um, uh, to, uh, to work with the labor market. Um, and we therefore developed a dialogue with the labor market um, uh, stakeholders. And uh, with the labor market stakeholders, we are talking about the employment agencies, companies, um, but also uh, governmental organizations uh, concerned with the, with the labor market. Um, if I, I can't change my own slide, so yeah. Uh, together um, with the labor market uh, um, stakeholders, we uh, develop, co-develop, co-deliver, and use MOOCs to, uh, to overcome the gap in the offerings, actually, because for continuing education, we need uh, many online courses and, and programs, and the MOOC providers um, together can fill in this gap. Um, uh, but therefore, the courses need to be uh, relevant, of quality, and recognized. And that is why we uh, need to, to work together with, uh, with the labor market stakeholders, but also work on this uh, micro credential. Um, yeah, the uh, next slide, please. So uh, behind the rationale behind uh, um, uh, working uh, together and also developing a micro credential is that um, even if we have quality courses and rele relevant courses um, and also recognized courses, they have to be uh, visible. Um, so at this moment, you see that there are so many certificates and badges. It is not very clear or uh, very transparent of what uh, an award is, um, the value of, of an award is. And that is when we uh, all together with the, the MOOC platforms uh, set together and, um, and uh, uh, start working on this qualification. In the next slide, you can see that um, uh, here we, there was an inventory made about uh, an, an analysis of 450 MOOC-based uh, micro-credentials, in which you see uh, also the, the micro-masters of which was referred to and uh, um, uh, some other uh, edX programs, Coursera programs, but they are very diverse in uh, the, the time um, spent by the student, but also on, on the content or the qualification structure. And that is, uh, that is taken as a basis for the, the uh, for starting up this um, a common framework for micro-credential. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, our ambition in the field of micro-credentials of the uh, European MOOC uh, Consortium Partners is to lay the foundations for a new qualification to address the needs of employers and learners looking for smaller units of study that develop relevant skills. Enable courses to be recognized towards formal qualifications, but also uh, stackable. And uh, therefore, in the next slide, we have taken the Bologna tools to, um, to develop this uh, common micro-credential framework. And we have uh, launched this the first time in April uh, 2019. So, so we are uh, already a year further in, in this. We have tweaked it a bit, but not, uh, uh, not much. In the end, uh, we are talking about about five ECTS, uh, 100 to 150 hours workload. It depends a bit on the on the country or ECTS system um, 
can be four to six ECTS, uh, average of five. Uh, that is in line with the workable uh, uh, and realistic uh, study hours of about eight hours a week for a student. We have focused on higher education, a level six, seven, um, with an option of level five only in combination with the uh, provision of ECTS. There can also be level five without ECTS. Um, we're talking about uh, providing assessment, enabling the award of the ac academic credit, uh, ID verification, so all elements that are important um, to understand what the award is, uh, what the value is of the award. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Well, to, uh, not, it's not only about developing this, this framework, but in the end, it's about the impact of, uh, of a common microcredential framework. And the impact can only be uh, gained by um, having it widely endorsed and widely used. So our task to, to our MOOC platforms was to develop as many um, um, CMF, um, uh, well, as many courses and programs in line with the CMF framework. Um, here we see the example from um, FutureLearn, one of our platforms that already started with uh, going into uh, the, the sky, or, well, exploring with their um, partners, with their clients, to provide uh, programs in line with CMF. And here you see they have a dedicated page now on CMF um, uh, related uh, programs. On the, on the next slide, you also see that uh, there is one launched by uh, uh, DCU, uh, Dublin City University, they're also very much in line with our and belief in our CMF uh, system. In the end, uh, you can imagine that we have, uh, like I said in the first slide, we have four, more than 400 higher education institutions connected to our MOOC platforms in Europe. That means by the endorsement by all 400 uh, higher education institutions, the impact and the adoption of CMF uh, um, will grow steadily uh, and, and, and fast in the, coming, in the coming years. So we are very happy with, with uh, universities like DCU and others that are committed to uh, develop programs in line with, with the CMF. Um, next slide, please. So to, uh, to make them, uh, well, to, for students and employers to recognize them, we also need to have a, um, a kind of a branding, not only referring to CMF, uh, but by the branding, like uh, they have taken up by FUN, um, Miriada X and AD Open in the southern European part, they're going to call these courses Gradeo. Gradeo is then uh, um, an awarded course in line with CMF. FutureLearn will take a different, um, a different name, so there can be a different name, but um, uh, they all are connected with CMF. So CMF is, is kind of the framework under which we can brand uh, uh, a few different names, not too many, of course. Yeah, uh, next, please. To position the micro-credentials and uh, CMF, uh, uh, so to say, uh, within uh, the, the offerings, you have the short courses by, offered by MOOCs, then you have the micro-credentials, which are in line with four to six ECTS, and then building up two degrees. Not necessarily, but we, we, uh, we uh, emphasize that it is important that it can be stackable uh, towards degrees. And then uh, my final slide, I just want to position, um, it's in the next slide, I just want to position here the short learning programs. So uh, this is an overview in green of the um, uh, spectrum of stackable provisions in online continuing education, uh, and then specifically in green, the short learning programs. So you see that the, the very short, the micro learning short programs, which are uh, less than one HTTS uh, on top then we have the normal courses, MOOCs, the single courses, um, which are one or more ACTS. And then you have the, the programs, which um, are under Gradeo, CMF, uh, that are um, built as programs for a kind of a sector in the market um, that have uh, the learning objectives explained that are in line, that are indicated by the qualification framework and so on, that is uh, five ACTS. And then we have the bigger short learning programs, we call them now, of, uh, of about up to 30 ECTS. But then they can be built from um, six CMFs, six Cradeos, for example. So these are, can be building blocks to a certified program, which uh, are currently indicated uh, um, as programs as undergraduate 
postgraduate certificates, specialization diplomas. So they can be building blocks to, to short learning programs. And then you have the level of uh, the degree programs, bachelor, master, doctorate. So th this, this is where we position it. And um, uh, CMF is uh, here the building block of uh, five ECTS uh, agreed upon um, within our MOOC platforms. And uh, the next step uh, will be, and that is uh, to, to close, is that we further endorse the, the use of CMF. We are now registering the, this as a trademark, as a, as a, as a framework, qualification framework, um, with the different names of Gradeo and maybe some other names uh, connected to that and uh, to, to be further enrolled uh, in, in Europe. Thanks. Thank you very much, George, uh, for your presentation. Uh, there is a lot of information for us to digest. And I think the participants are also still digesting. Uh, but if anybody has a question, please uh, write it in the question and answer uh, section or in the chat as well at this moment. Uh, uh, I can pick them up from there. Mm -hmm. Seems that, um, George, it was all very clear. Uh, we'll just have to then work on how to bring all these different ways of dealing with micro-credentials together uh, if we want a kind of a comprehensive uh, framework with one type of approach. Okay, there might be some questions here now, it seems. Uh, so, George, do you imagine as a good option a formal enrollment to the higher education institution in order to have the micro-credential recognized, even if it was achieved in another place or at another time? Well, yes, you, you can, of course, use uh, micro-credentials also as awarding uh, um, uh, prior knowledge. Uh, um, so in, the, in the, that system, it, it's possible to bring us forward that you, uh, that you come from one level one system to another and have it uh, recognized as uh, prior knowledge or as prior experience. Yeah, thank you. Then there is another question which is from Elena. What is the difference between short uh, learning programs and the modules? Um, as, uh, as was described earlier in the chat, for example, in the Swedish system. Yeah, the, short, uh, <laughs> the definition of a short learning program, we are also not very happy with, with the term because you have also the short cycle programs and which is very different or the, 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 the short courses which can be very in, instructional or so. What we, what we mean with the short learning programs are really um, uh, uh, programs which are built from, from, uh, from courses into a, a, a curriculum program that really uh, is a kind of a, a, an upskilling. Um, of around uh, 30 ECTS, so it's really a, a substantial, substantial program, and for which we have looked also into the relevance for the sector uh, for upskilling re or reskilling. Um, yeah, the, the, it's a it's a definition uh, issue. Uh, I, I I would not dare to solve here. Uh, let's say let's take that one to, to the working groups tomorrow. Uh, very good. Uh, thank you very much, George. Point taken. So there, the working groups will, will need to last uh, the whole week, I suppose, with all the questions we have raised and not been able to answer yet. But uh, actually, the reassuring part is that the working groups will then continue after tomorrow's meeting to work for, for the next year. So, uh, so we hope to be able to have some more answers as we go ahead. Good. Thanks again uh, very much, uh, George, and thanks for those who posed some, some questions. Um, uh, to, to him. Um, and we'll move uh, on to the next uh, speaker, final in this one hour session of snapshots of different approaches. Uh, that is Rolf Reinhardt, uh, who is a member of the executive committee at the International Council of Badges and Credentials, which ensures the systemic view of badges and credentials for individual, individuals, organizations, society. Um, but he also works for LinkedIn, um, which is at the intersection of, let's say, government education and corporate learning. So that's a very interesting position from which to talk about micro-credentials. Uh, um, we've asked uh, Rolf to, to contribute to our webinar, to our conference today, and indeed from this perspective to say, okay, we talk and we think a lot about micro-credentials in the, in the system of universities in Europe uh, in particular, 
But what about the, let's say, other providers? How does that fit into the perspective of the employability and how to deal with the micro-credentials in, in that context? So I'm very happy to give the floor to you, Rolf. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks a lot and hello everyone. So like, um, first of all, as you announced already, so I'm like, you know, in different networks and organizations. So among which the International Council on Badges and Credentials is the newest one. And yeah, we founded it basically with that idea in mind to ensure transparency uh, as uh, Professor Bonatibakorn mentioned and this holistic approach, uh, what Vanessa said. And um, yeah, so uh, as I see, there's a little bit of more time <laughs> for me in that, um, in that presentation, thanks to you, George. Uh, so I can start with a little anecdote. Uh, so I studied uh, media technology and at that time when I studied, uh, my father warned me and said, but why are you studying that? And, and it was back in 2002. There are no jobs available for that. And indeed, it was such a new type of study that the traditional job market was not ready to take us on. You know, there were no job ads uh, in relation to that. But um, fortunately, I did it because I can say that still today I benefit of what I've learned in their studies. So um, when we look at the traditional relationship between like the employers and the job market and so on, and maybe also the link to a higher education, we see these job ads. Uh, we see the job title that is referring to. We see the location where they want to place someone. We see the experience, if it's a beginner or several years or so of experience. And then we also see like a range of other things that are becoming increasingly important and which will also be like one of the like strong emphasis within the presentation. And that, uh, that is on tools, methods, and what I call it like soft skills in quotes, because those skills are not soft at all. They are indeed the core competences that nowadays everyone needs, uh, as Professor uh, Bundit Tivakon already outlined in the, in the keynote. And uh, the funny thing is like, I don't know if you can see that, but so this job ad is open since eight months. It has a couple of views but uh, only seven applicants. Uh, and uh, that illustrates um, how the system is kind of broken, you know, this traditional system, because these people who have these qualifications, they don't apply for a job anymore. They get hired, you know, from, they, they basically get hired from a headhunter or directly by reaching out from, from the different companies that want to hire them. And uh, we see that like kind of, um, uh, you know, like as an example, I used here actually a German job description because in Germany we st we still see a reference to a university degree in such a, a respect to hiring a software engineer. In other countries, such as in the US or in the UK or Ireland or so, you don't see that anymore. So um, the the interesting thing is when we look at like the, the job market needs. Uh, we can see from LinkedIn side um, how many professionals are in a certain market. So just to give you some context, we have 709 million professionals on LinkedIn with a profile. Um, I don't know if you have a LinkedIn profile, but if you have one, you know that we look at like the job title that you have currently and the job titles that you have had in the past, the skills linked to that job title the company where you are working at, uh, at the very moment and also in the past. And then we see also your location. And based on that, we can, you know, draw some insights that are like super interesting for labor market policies and also to higher education institutions, because the higher education institutions in the end, they should, you know, educate the, the workforce for their respective um, uh, region. And um, of course we could, give some, you know, like consultancy to employers where they should maybe like open um, an office or so in order to tap into a talent pool. That is what we call a hidden gem location, you know, where there is in comparison to other regions, 
still talent may be available or might be easier to get. Okay. And uh, so you see also with whom you're competing, uh, like uh, you're basically competing against the top employers, the top employers basically providing a lot of perks, etc. And yeah, so these top employers already shifted their hiring needs from a degree towards these soft skills or core competences and the methods and tools. And um, the interesting thing is like, it's not just about hiring your workforce. So what we've also learned uh, this morning uh, in the keynote is that our world is increasingly dynamic uh, and the skills that have been maybe important when the curriculum at the university was designed might be nowadays outdated or should be enriched by an additional skill set. Um, and this information is also something that we had access. So first of all, as the market gets more difficult, you have to prioritize your requirements. And if you prioritize your requirements being the skills, the methods and the tools, uh, you also should be aware of what is changing. So we see, for example, for um, the occupation of a software engineer in a certain area, so we can even drill down. This is like the area of Europe, Middle East, Africa, and in a certain industry, like here is the software and IT services. What skills is, are available uh, as of the very moment based on the LinkedIn profiles? The second one is um, in relation to what are the in-demand skills because this is like in particular interesting we don't have only the uh, the members displaying their skills we also have the data on the recruiters searching for particular skills uh, and we see also that there are new skills added to these searches um, basically like every day you know and these new skills are tied to the fastest growing skills and that's an uh, very, very interesting data to look at, you know, like uh, globally or within a region, which skills in a certain segment related to a certain profession or occupation, uh, which is maybe even a better terminology, are uh, becoming increasingly important. And this is what everyone has to catch up with. I mean, not just the higher education organizations that are mainly targeting like these first time students, but the labor market in general, like all the employers, they have to know, okay, what skills are emerging and how do I place them into my company? And there's an additional uh, requirement that we see in particular in larger organizations and also um, at the ministry level and the governments, which is um, what skills do we have in a certain region or in a certain department and to which extent can we reorganize these skills? So for countries, this is mainly relates to infrastructure projects. So or when they you know, change the, the, the scope of a, of a certain occupation profile, uh, like from mining to, I don't know, biotechnology or so, if that's like the, the gap that they want to close. But then also in the companies, we have something which is called workforce planning or strategic workforce planning, where they look into, okay, what skills do we have in which department? And what skills can we move and create maybe new departments or so uh, in order to remain agile. So um, based on that, we came together, like, you know, we started that within LinkedIn and Microsoft with a couple of people and um, quickly there were like 62 organizations gathering around that topic uh, under this basic principle of uh, a holistic view. And the holistic view also included an international view because you know what we could see like in the um, in this first cross-regional education and training academies um, bucket so to say there's an increasing need for some organization uh, organizations to train globally uh, via online academies but to have it recognized regionally or nationally for example the world health organization uh, they want to develop an academy for 10 million workers in the healthcare area and uh, that should be recognized also at a local level, uh, at you know degree level or a nurse, whatever you know, like a doctor level. Then we have the development bank. So we also have the World Bank. But interestingly, here I, I'm, I'm, I mention more the uh, development banks because they look at upskilling initiatives in specific countries. So, like for example, in Africa, they look at leapfrogging initiatives 
from agriculture to knowledge economy. So how would that go, you know? And uh, we also look at uh, refugees and international migration uh, in, in order to like, you know, uh, validate their prior learning experiences and also the uh, degrees that they have obtained in their home countries in order to give them like kind of a chance on a job market. Yeah, then we have the international standardization committees. So which I think is also like super important to work with them because eventually what you need to ensure is technical interoperability, but then also an alignment on taxonomy standards. And we see that, you know, like these taxonomy standards, they are coming up within like regional networks or national networks. Like for example, in the US, we see like a relatively high proficiency in that respect. But um, in order to tap into those, and, and Europe also, you know, has their taxonomies aligned with um, ESCO or um, in, in with the International Labour uh, Organization standards, the ISCO. But um, I think it's very important to translate that into so-called ontologies and make them machine readable. Yeah, then we have the large organizations that are using the badges internally and were, they were looking into, okay, to which extent can we actually get recognition outside? Because these organizations, they are exchanging stuff uh, like in certain ecosystems, for example, um, at the United Nations. Uh, so it's very common that uh, that these people are fluctuating between the different agencies. And the question was, okay, uh, how can we enable and facilitate such a process? And then of course you have the companies that are supporting the digital transformation. I mean, that's like a very general term because it's difficult to put that in, but uh, we see that um, at the moment we have a lot of like specialized uh, companies that are working on badges and credentials uh, and in consultancy and so on, but uh, they also need to, you know, come together in line. And thirdly, I mean, lastly, I mean, on, on, on fifth point, we have the credit education providers and networks. And um, I guess this is a big chance for them not to get disconnected from what's going on. I mean, not to react to what is going on, but to take the chance and proactively shape the future as I guess, yeah, Anthony was inviting everyone. And um, so within that network, I mean, we officially launched on the 1st of November. Um, we actually uh, did a call and said, so we have the possibility to do a presentation within that scope. So, and who wants to do some examples? And yeah, we received a couple of examples and we selected them based on what could provide the most value for you um, as, as a target group in order to learn and derive some conclusion for your own uh, policies and strategies. So one is uh, LinkedIn Learning and the Project Management Institute. And it's just an example of like a recognition network that is as of the moment, like very small, but I guess that for the higher education organizations, it's good to tap into such recognition networks. So like LinkedIn Learning is a course library with 16,000 courses. Um, yeah, one course, so it like uh, is developed within three to four months. Uh, now compare that to a higher education course that takes like three to four years until the accreditation. So the, the pace is extremely fast. Uh, but I mean, I could also show like uh, many other providers doing this, the same thing. It's uh, not anymore about the content um, that you are creating a course with. It's about eventually what can I do with it and what's the recognition. So when you take such a course and um, you finish it, you can see this course was part of an official curriculum at some providers. Huh? So we have like the Project Management Institute where you can directly get credits. But then we also have the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy where you say, okay, you can get credits but you first have to pass an exam. And later on, like these validation scenarios uh, that George uh, referred to, like for example, check the ID, et cetera, that is done basically uh, afterwards. What we do like in LinkedIn is we add a recognition, uh, which is a skill. Uh, and this skill is having a direct tie into the labor market needs, so to say, because it can be identified by recruiters. But um, we don't have this validation, you know, we only have like kind of okay, a signal, so to say. However, in the world of a recruiter who has maybe two seconds to judge a candidate, this could be like an, a, a very important part because this filters the algorithm. 
Okay, and that's also what I think that higher education would need to look into. Yeah, and uh, then of course there's kind of a recognition that it's more on a like uh, informal level where your peers can applaud you and say, oh, wow, great, great job that you did that or you showed us that you had an interest in the topic. So um, if you want to have more information around that or if you want to access labor market data for your country or your region or your organization, uh, based on the LinkedIn data, you can actually reach out to a colleague of mine. His name is Jake. Um, yeah, so if you like. So the next example is uh, it's pretty interesting. So it's Badger, which is the platform behind the Open Badges and the, um, the International, so Inter-American Development Bank and the Project Management Institute. And um, this links directly to a job occupation profile, similar to the example that uh, Anthony mentioned with Google. Uh, so they created their MOOCs and uh, they say, if you take these MOOCs in combination with other um, parties, so certificates of other parties, such as the Project Management Institute, you can actually get to a higher classification of a job profile and that's valued within that organization. And uh, there's an in interesting blog post around it, around capability academies uh, by Josh Burson that I can really like recommend to you because this gives so, so to say meaning to learning in terms of employability and job perspectives. So here you can contact Elizabeth from, from Concentric Sky if you want to hear more about such models, uh, email addresses here. So um, then we have third example from Credly and the Hospitality Main uh, organization. And this is related to like badges that are coming out of the vocational training center. And um, other badges are used kind of as a stimulation to say, look what you could do now, you can specialize in different other fields. And this is then later on recognized at an association. And again, that leads to an employment possibility, such as for example, an apprenticeship at the Hilton Hotel Group. Uh, and um, for more information, you can, um, you can actually send an email to Brenda, her email address is this bit here. And now we come to like the fourth and last example, which is uh, I'm, I'm saying one of my favorites, because I'm, you remembered uh, this. Do you remember what I said about the soft skills or core competences? They said this is the basis of everything you do in terms of employability. And uh, they developed a grid. Uh, so yesterday I showed it to my wife. She said, "Wow, it's it's all there." Uh, so it's all there. What they would look into for a candidate uh, that they would hire in her company. And um, so this is basically um, like the, the, the leads to like kind of a passport, like an employability passport. And then what they did within that recognition network at uh, their region, they said, okay, you have different options um, after you, uh, you know, obtained that passport where you want to go. And there are different organizations where you can learn on the job and develop a special expertise in various fields. Okay, so this is more related to uh, like the, the, the yeah, vocational school level, but I think it's really interesting and taps also into these yeah, potential uh, pathways that you could take that we've seen also in this example by, um, yeah, in, in this morning by uh, Professor Bunde Tipakon. So, um, if you want to have more information here, you can contact uh, Gerard uh, at the email address that is mentioned here. So in summary, I think what is important is that uh, to recognize that there is a war for talent and, and for good people out there, not just in the software industry. I mean, you can, you can look into the engineering, the marketing, uh, pretty much all kind of sector that is affected by the digital transformation or the fourth industrial revolution, which is, I would say, most, most of the sectors nowadays. And um, then, so uh, it's, I guess, like important, uh, and, and that's just an echoing of what uh, was said, I guess, like a couple of times, not to just look at like this particular skill uh, within the degree, uh, like linked to, um, you know, a certain profession, but the general core competences or soft skills which eventually also would give you like the resilience, the, the possibility to collaborate, to adapt, 
etc. And uh, what is often also referred to some extent like future skills. Um, and then third, yeah, I think that what is important is to, to recognize these awesome methods and tools. And this is the chance in my view for um, the higher education sector. So to get together with the employers uh, and uh, the representatives of the talent market and to think, okay, what can we do here in order to recognize that and to validate it and maybe also to rate it to some levels and nothing against the European qualifications framework, but I think we need to some extent also to ease a little bit uh, of the process of this recognition. Uh, so <laughs> so the, e the easier it is to use, I think the better it will scale at a later stage, in particular when there's an understanding of the labor market, uh, say, okay, these are the certain, uh, you know, that grids that we would need to use. Yeah, and the last one is that eventually it's just about ensuring this holistic approach. And I guess that we can only ensure it when we get out of our, you know, ivory tower and so on. And even today, so I'm again, like very happy that you invited me because I guess it's important also to bring in that view from uh, the labor market that eventually should benefit of the students, not just the first time students, but also of the higher education institutions of ensuring that we, you know, uh, remain high and a highly educated uh, workforce in, in Europe and, and internationally. Exactly. Um, so that's, that's from my side and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, uh, Rolf, uh, for that presentation. It's very interesting to get a bit of a different uh, viewpoint, but which I think is very much aligned with what we've been discussing earlier today and in our project uh, also more widely. So I'm begging for people to send you some questions, uh, but for the moment we'll give them a minute, perhaps to type their questions if there is anything anybody wants to ask or if somebody of the other speakers would like to, to ask a question to you, that would be also very nice. Maybe in the meantime, I just pick up a comment that was made in the chat, which is that data analysis is important for the development of when developing the micro credentials, but it of course only works if enough people give access to their profile. And there's the GDPR and we have to be careful about data protection and things like that. So uh, is there anything that you would like to, to mention something more about that aspect? Yeah, so eventually it's everyone's choice to have a profile or not on LinkedIn and also what they put on that profile. Um, and of course, I mean, we are GDPR compliant to a, a very high extent, I mean, to 100%. So, so the user has to provide that consent, uh, like that uh, he shares the data with us and so on. He, and the user does that because he expects a certain benefit that is like the employability benefit, but then also being part of community. Thank you. Th then I ha had a question. Is your perspective, you know, what is your perception? What really matters? Is it I mean, putting in a bit of a silly term, is it the skills or is it the certificates? So it's a, it's a very interesting question. I mean, um, you know, like the funny thing is that in the beginning we saw in the job posting, yeah, you should have that degree or equivalent, you know, equivalent. And then I talked yesterday with my wife about it and she studied English literature. Now she works in a, a mobile marketing company, you know, like totally different. So, and she said, yeah, she got a job because she had a degree, whatever degree, you know, and we kind of discussed about it. So the certificate, however, you know, is something important because it shows something to the individual and it shows something to the outside world. Um, I would say that most, so like, for example, with LinkedIn Learning, the user can also log in without any personally identifiable information, you know, just with a token without name and so on, but then he has no name on the certificate. And uh, the funny thing is that eventually, the user wants his name on that certificate. And if you look at yourself and the seminars that you have attended, what eventually you want to get is a certificate of completion or a certificate of attendance. Yeah. And um, however, when you look at some companies, like for example, Amazon, so a friend of mine, he works for Amazon, he has not studied at all and he has no work experience. However, he has the skills, they invited him to, uh, to, 
um, like interviews where he had to showcase his skills. He had to work in two teams and show that he is better than uh, than the fifty percent of the Amazon workforce. That's kind of the basis on what they hire. So they got him. He was better. They got him the job. So it depends a little bit on uh, on the employer and on the telemarket. If the telemarket is so big that the employer could choose from I don't know hundreds of applicants, maybe the certificate would make a difference. But if it's very very tight, then it's what eventually what you can do that counts. Yes, thank you. That was a bit of a naughty. It was almost a trick question, but I think there isn't a, a simple, easy answer. But you you gave a kind of very nice perspective on that. So thank you for that. Um, I don't see any other questions coming up and the time is also up. So I thank you again, Rolf, uh, for joining us for this. Uh, and I hope you can hang out for the final sessions as well. Thank so you. Uh, we'll move on to the next um, speaker, who is uh, somebody you've already met today. Uh, that is uh, Magali Sernen, who is a policy advisor for higher education at the Flemish Ministry of Education in Belgium. And she's, um, she's also representing um, the Flemish community in the Bologna process and in the ASIM process. And she's a co-chair of the Bologna Peer Support Group on Quality Assurance and the Bologna Coordination Group on Global Policy Dialogue. So she's very well versed with the, with the Bologna agendas uh, and also with this collaboration with other world regions, of course. Um, and most importantly today, of course, she is the project coordinator for the Micropol project. And we've alluded to the project many times in the course of this morning, uh, but you haven't really heard what it is uh, about in its entirety. So I will give Magali the chance to explain to you something more about the project. Please, Magali, go ahead. Well, thank you, Maria, to give the floor back to me. Um, yes, uh, now we'll... Uh, really go into the project and its activities. After uh, we received from all the previous speakers a lot of general information uh, on what is going on in the field of uh, micro-credentials. So, um, if I can control, see? Yes, so the details of the project, just for your information, the title is Micro-Credentials Linked to the Bologna Key Commitments. So, um, as you have heard, a lot of projects are going on uh, on the topic of micro-credentials or um, have finished already. A lot of things are going on in the field as well, uh, in companies, um, but we in, in our project, we really want to focus on this link um, with um, the, the Bologna process. So um, the project um, is an Erasmus plus KE3, so policy support project. Um, from the call of uh, 2019. Um, the project um, started um, at the end of March this year and will run for two years. So the partners of the project, um, we, the Flemish Ministry of Education and Training of Belgium, we are the coordinator of the project. And we have, of course, the help from our partners, uh, which is uh, from Finland, the Ministry of Education and Culture. From uh, Italy, Italy, we have uh, CIMEA, which is the Inclinaric Center. We have the European University Association and we have uh, ENQUA. Um, furthermore, we have also a number of experts um, that are linked to our project. Some of uh, them you already heard this morning. So Anthony Camilleri and George Ubax, I don't have to introduce them to you anymore. Um, furthermore, we have Friedrich de Decker. Um, he is the head of the International Office of Ghent University in Belgium. Um, because we thought it's really important also to, to have the view of the universities themselves into our project. Um, furthermore, we have um, uh, Cathy Isaacs, who is um, um, a CTS uh, expert for a long time and currently also the vice chair of the Bologna process. And last but not least, we have Peter van der Heijden, who is an individual um, independent expert, worked for a long time for the commission, and I assume that most of you already know him well. So the aim of our project, um, when I first started to think about uh, this project, um, maybe, well, maybe now you have the same idea as I had at that time. Um, 
I heard that so much is going on in the field, in companies, in our higher education institutions. And I had a feeling that um, for many of us um, at national government level, we were not really um, engaged in this topic. We didn't really know what was going on yet in the field. So the main, one of the main aims of this project is really to raise awareness among national governments um, and also to encourage and guide the governments to include micro credentials on their policy agenda. And, and to see how um, we can connect these micro-credentials in, in a compatible way to our existing degree programs, how to, to deal with um, these new forms of learning. Um, furthermore, um, what I already told you was um, the importance um, to see how these micro-credentials fit into the Bologna process. And therefore, we have to check whether the existing tools that we have within Bologna if they are fit for micro-credentials and or if we have to propose changes for adaptations on European level. Um, one of the other aims of our project is also to come up with recommendations um, to check um, if adaptations to national legislations are needed. And finally, we also want to create a European framework for micro-credentials to propose to the ministers in, within the Bologna process not only within the Bologna process, but as you heard also from Vanessa, the European Commission is um, putting this also really high on their agenda. So we try to align the work of the project with the work of the European Commission um, as, as good as possible. Now, tell, let me tell you something about the structure of our project. So the first um, task within the project was the desk research. So this has been performed by uh, EUA and you have all received a draft publication of this res desk research report. Um, the idea is that um, from this um, webinar today and um, also with the input of the working groups tomorrow, um, we still add um, some extra items to the desk research and we would then um, send you the final uh, publication by mid of September. So desk research was the first month of um, our project and then of course um, which is going on now we have the kickoff conference um, with informing everyone um, on the general topic of micro-credentials now today in the webinar and have the discussion um, during the kickoff of the working groups. So the work Working groups, um, we have um, one working group on each Bologna key commitment. So we have a group on quality assurance, one on qualification frameworks, and one on recognition. So for these groups, we asked the Bologna follow up group members to nominate um, persons from their country that could officially uh, attend those meetings of the working groups. So the working group on QA will be. Uh, chaired by Belgian Flemish community with the help of uh, two of our experts, Peter van der Heijden and Anthony Camilleri. For the moment, we have about 50 persons registered for this working group from 27 countries and six stakeholder organizations. The next working group is the one on qualification frameworks, chaired by Finland, uh, with the help of experts George Ubax and Cathy Isaacs. Also uh, 50 uh, registered participants from 28 countries, six stakeholder organizations. And the third one is the recognition group uh, that will be chaired um, by Italy and with the help of the experts Friedrich de Decker and Peter van der Heijden. And there we also have among um, uh, almost the same number of participants, 49 participants, 26 countries, seven stakeholder organizations. So, um, as I already mentioned in my introductory speech with 150 participants for the webinar today and about 50 participants for each of the working groups, this is really um, a huge success for us for this project. It's more than we uh, had expected, but of course, uh, everyone is very much welcome um, to work with us on these topics. Um, on the other hand, it will be a challenge to have um, due to the corona crisis, um, online workshops with 50 people, but we'll try to manage this as well as possible um, tomorrow. Um, so 
a next um, part of the project is um, that we will uh, try to come up uh, with a European framework for micro-credentials. Um, don't ask me any questions um, now on how that should look like, um, what uh, items should be in there, because that's really something that we want to develop together with all of you, with the people on, in the working groups. So um, we have um, one year time um, to discuss, uh, to work together and to put together um, uh, different aspects that can be taken up in this framework. And of course, oh, sorry, that was too quick. And of course, at the end, we will also have a final conference um, within this project, um, where also, like today, all BFUG members, ministry stakeholder organizations, and nominees to the working groups will be invited. So, um, as already partly mentioned, the target groups for our project are the national governments, BFUG representatives, and the national um, stakeholder organizations, as well as international stakeholder organizations. Um, there is also a link with the existing Bologna peer support groups. Um, as Maria um, explained in her introduction, I have been the co-chair of the Bologna peer support group on QA for the last two years. But also the other um, leading um, partners in the project, um, meaning uh, the, the partners that will lead the working groups, Finland and Italy, have been co-chairing uh, one of those uh, Bologna peer support groups the last two years. So we all three have the experience of working in this um, peer learning structure. And I thought it might be very useful also um, to keep the link with um, the peer support groups also in the coming work period of uh, the Bologna um, process. The timing of the project, so um, as already explained, the desk research was and is still ongoing. Um, you received the input um, for this uh, conference. It will be adjusted um, even more um, now uh, after the conference and you will receive the final one by mid-September. Of course, today and tomorrow we have the kickoff conference and then the working groups will start working for the period of one year. So by end of spring, by summer 2021, we should have some results um, of these working groups that we can also share with the European Commission in their, um, well, link to their roadmap as well. So we can align as much as possible. And then in the last six months of the project, um, we will be preparing recommendations uh, for national governments and also uh, the common framework for um, micro-credentials. So that was it for me for the moment. Um, I don't know if there are any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, thank you very much, Magali. Um, it seems that for the moment there are no questions, but please do, do send them in if you have any. And if we've already moved on, please still write the questions and we will try to find a way to answer those. So um, it's good the project is only beginning because we do have still uh, many more questions than answers, but, uh, but that's, a, that's a very nice work we have ahead of us. So to move on and now, last but of course not least, uh, my colleague Tia Lokola, Director for Institutional Development at the European University Association EUA, um, who's worked for very many years in the field of quality assurance and focusing mainly on kind of internal quality assurance issues, so in the university context. Um, but she's also the director of the institutional evaluation program of the EUA, which is a uh, kind of a, it, it's an accreditation program, quality assurance program for institutions, uh, any, any place uh, in Europe, they can pick up this program and take part in it. Uh, and uh, Tia has been also involved a lot in the Bologna process. Uh, she is a member of the Bologna Implementation Coordination Group and also of the, of the uh, thematic peer groups, both on recognition and on quality assurance. So uh, Tia will make this link uh, now a little bit on what we've heard about MOOCs, what we've learned about MOOCs in the study carried out by EUA, and how do we integrate then all of this into the European higher education area framework, so all the different tools we have in that context. So please, Tia, go ahead. 
Thank you very much, Maria. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, but I also realize that I am the last person standing between you and uh, lunch uh, after a very uh, intensive morning and long morning. So I will keep my uh, presentation relatively short. And uh, I think it should be uh, quite easy to do because a lot of these things have been said. And uh, I hope that many of you have also um, had a quick look at the disk research we've done so to prepare the work of the working groups. But what I will try to now do is to make a link to what we've heard today to what you're going to do tomorrow and in the next stages of the project. So we're looking into uh, three commitments in Bologna process. And I would like to start by asking a question to you. So this would be the time to go to menti.com again, and you will soon uh, see a screen where you will see the, the code, if I can get my lovely assistant to give us the view to the Menti question. Uh, thank you very much. So the code is in the upper corner of the uh, side of the screen light. So we would want to kind of uh, test the pulse a little bit. What do you think now before the work of the group starts? To, what, to which degree do you think the tools on key commitments are applicable to micro-credentials? Do we need to change them? Do, we, do you think they are not applicable, applicable at all or strongly applicable? Where are the problems? So the qualification frameworks and ECTS are, are about the first key commitment. And then we've got uh, Lisbon Recognition Convention and uh, Diploma Supplement, which are linked to the key commitments of uh, recognition. And then the EST, which is linked to quality assurance in line with the EST. Interesting how you are answering at the moment, how many, um, how they are applicable because this will give us um, the idea of what we can expect in the groups in the discussions and um, I see that it's getting to the middle of it but uh, most of them are going to the strongly applicable ah uh, I can see also that there are perhaps some disagreements between what I would want to say myself and what I will be arguing next uh, for you. So um, it looks like the ECTS would be the most applicable hmm. and the, the Lisbon recognition the least, although the differences are very limited at this stage. So uh, I think uh, we might Okay, I will give, leave this for a little bit more uh, because I wanted to talk about something that um, what we did in our, in our desk research, we intentionally left the, uh, in the end of each section questions for you. So to guide the work of your, your, your uh, group in the next stages because we, we, we didn't want to give you all the answers. And I think the many of the questions we've seen in the chat also, um, demonstrate that there is a worth of discussing these matters. But what I want to at this stage uh, uh, um, underline in response to some of the discussion in the in the chat is that we are when we talk about qualification frameworks in in this context we talk about the qualification framework for European higher education area. We don't talk about EQF. Uh, because EQF is the Euro European Commission uh, framework, whereas uh, the topic of this project is, is in the Bologna process. Uh, similarly, there were questions about the definition and so on, whether they could be the same. Um, we've now proposed, and I think in your groups you will be discussing it tomorrow even more, we've proposed that the definition makes clear linkages to these uh, Bologna tools which then are not necessarily applicable to, to the European Commission uh, approach to micro-credentials and their definition because uh, 
that definition tries to cover all educational sectors, whereas our focus um, as general rule is on higher education. Okay, I think we can uh, uh, close the poll knowing that uh, ECTS seems to be the most applicable uh, and the Lisbon recognition the least. We'll see what uh, the result of the, of the projects will be in the end once we've you've really had time to discuss these matters. So I'll go quickly through some of the questions we've had uh, and we've posed in the desk research. So what we did is we, we looked at the different documents. What do they really say in those documents and how could those they relate to microcredentials? So we've really snooped around different uh, documents uh, that were produced in the Bologna process. So qualification frameworks and ECTS uh, is actually the area where we have most questions to you. Um, and that's why I think it's interesting that you found that ECTS would be the easiest one to apply for the micro-credentials. Um, so the, the kind of questions you are going to be discussing are the, how should micro-credentials relate to the qualification framework in the European higher education area? Uh, what size is a micro-credential supposed to be in ECTS? You saw that there were some proposals already made by Anthony and uh, George uh, explaining what they could be and what their projects have proposed. Could we use the lessons learned from the short cycle uh, discussions? Because the short cycle was added to the qualification framework in the European higher education area. Um, in 2018, or let's say it was uh, redefined in that context. So perhaps could that kind of discussion help us in thinking how to relate the micro-credentials to the framework? Uh, similarly, could allocation of ECTS to modules, as we know that from the ECTS user's guide, could that help in, in advising how to use ECTS? And one interesting thing is that what we noticed is that not all the micro-credentials that are at the moment uh, um, offered, not all of them define explicit learning outcomes. How do you then define the number of ECTS if the workload and the learning outcomes are not defined like the, uh, the kind of it is assumed that in order for you to use ECTS. I think there was an earlier question about the ECTS used by other, um, uh, of, uh, by other providers than higher education institutions. The ECTS user's guide actually says that each national authority decides who can award ECTS. So in principle, there could be um, a system where other than higher education institutions can also award ECTS credits. And there are examples, uh, uh, some were referred to by Rolf, for instance, where um, an organization does uh, use the principles of ECTS to define uh, the volume and the workload of their, of their, of their uh, micro-credential. So there are examples of others than higher education institutions doing these things. Lisbon Recognition Convention and the Diploma Supplement Interesting that that got the least support in terms of being applicable uh, to micro-credentials because looking at the text of the Lisbon Recognition Convention, one can quite easily start arguing that it is applicable. Um, it does talk about study periods. It doesn't only talk about qualifications, recognizing qualifications, but also study, peri study periods and a different kind of education. So there is really nothing in it that would say um, that we could not use the same principles of uh, fair and smooth recognition, um, which would be the, really the key issue. I think many speakers today have said that we need to ensure the recognition of micro-credentials in order to really develop this field. Um, but what is the issue is, is that uh, the Lisbon Recognition Convention does talk about 
um, education offered by accredited higher education institutions. And that's, that seems to be clear. If you're accredited higher education institution um, and you're offering micro-credentials, it should be in the, in the scope of the list point recognition convention. But then again, what about the other providers? We've heard there are a lot of other providers here in the field. Um, and the challenge may be that uh, to develop the processes and mechanisms for their recognition. But then again, I would maybe have perhaps argue that is the challenge really only the processes and mechanisms, or is it the general challenge of um, recognition in, as a whole? Are we to, is it attitude, attitudes and uh, willingness to recognize that we are really dealing with? But if we go beyond the attitudes, uh, maybe we can argue that uh, the recognition for prior learning could be something that uh, we can look into in terms of the processes and mechanisms. Uh, the quality of documentation or credential provided to the learner and information it conveys, this is very much linked to the diploma supplement. Uh, issue and uh, I think the previous speakers have talked about proposals on how to deal with the quality of the documentation. So I will not go into detail in that one, but it will be something that uh, the working group will be discussing. The EST and quality assurance. Um, there is one sentence. Uh, which would clearly indicate that the EST apply to micro-credentials, which says uh, the EST apply to all higher education offered in the European higher education area, regardless of the mode of study, place or delivery. So we could stop the discussion here, but actually there, is, there are some topics to be discussed beyond the EST. The EST puts all, the main responsibility for quality assurance with the higher education institutions, and it talks about higher education institutions a lot. Um, what about the other providers that we talked about? What if there is a other provider that is part of your higher education system? What happens then? Are they supposed to do what the part one says that the institutions are supposed to do? And there are some potential gaps in terms of the coverage of the external quality assurance if the provider is uh, other than higher education institution, do the quality assurance agencies uh, check the procedures of other providers? Not in all cases. Uh, and then the other question is when the external quality assurance focuses on program, so formal programs leading to bachelor or master's degrees, for instance, are, and the micro-credential is offered outside of these kind of programs. Is the quality, external quality assurance looking into uh, the, the micro-credentials? And like in many other is, uh, areas of higher education, um, there probably are some additional considerations that you need to take into account when you're developing micro-credential rather than developing a bachelor's or master's degree. Uh, what could they be? and where, at what level should they need to be addressed. Um, we know that, for instance, if you have a workplace learning, you have certain considerations. If you have online learning, you have different considerations. So for micro-credentials, what could these specificities be um, beyond? So a lot of this goes beyond the EST as such. Some concluding mark, remarks for you to, to keep in mind when, uh, when you go to the working groups is that We've identified that there is a diversity in the micro-credentials uh, sector and that we should see this diversity as a strength because it allows us to better respond to the needs of the labor market, the society, the, uh, the, the learner. Um, so, but there clearly is a need for clarity and transparency. Um, so how to do that? giving uh, further clarity and transparency while leaving room for diversity and creativity. In your groups, you probably need to find a right balance between the two. There's been re uh, presentations today about different kind of initiatives, including the European Commission initiative, 
we need to keep in mind the synergies and the complementarity between all these. And so similarly, um, uh, we need, I would say that the complementarity and synergies between the different working groups as well. Uh, there was in the chat already had a discussion with Anthony about something that has a word quality in it. Uh, but it's not necessarily something that quality assurance group will be discussing. It will, it will be the recognition group discussing the quality of credential. Or it will be the ECTS group talking about uh, how to assure the quality of um, ECTS uh, uh, um, allocated. So uh, interlinkages between the different Bologna tools become really crucial here right now in these kind of conversations. And um, one more question that I do have for you is, uh, should the Bologna process start addressing the other providers than higher education institutions? Will you be addressing them in your working group? Uh, we're not giving you the answer to that yet. I think that's something that you should discuss in your working group and to decide um, how do we deal with this diversifying uh, higher education uh, that we are at, at the moment seeing. If we take uh, the learner perspective uh, and student-centered learning really seriously, uh, these are questions that arise. So I think to a certain extent, it looks like micro-credentials are bringing uh, on the surface a lot of the challenges that are there other, um, anyway, but now in this context, it will be interesting to talk about them in the next two years in, uh, in the context of uh, micro-credentials. This is where I will wrap up and uh, it's time for any questions or lunch. If that's what thank you Thank you desire. very much, Tia. <laughs> thank you very much, Tia. I think the lunch will be very desirable at this point, but if you have any questions, please send them in. Uh, I will monitor the boxes while I give what I was asked to do, which is the concluding remarks of this morning. Uh, you are lucky because the only concluding remark I have is that it's far too early for any concluding remarks. Uh, so as you, we've said it many times today, we've raised more questions than we've answered, although we have also heard quite some interesting perspectives on the micro-credential topic. Um, but we in the project are very serious about these questions that we have received and collected and which we have also asked ourselves, which the speakers have asked uh, us to address. Um, and we will deal with those in a hopefully more participatory manner uh, in, the, in the months to come, in the coming years. So I would just say watch this space, um, have a look at the project website and there will be news for you uh, regularly. Um, and the only thing that remains then before we really close is to thank everybody, of course. I would like to Thank, first of all, all the speakers. Um, it's been great uh, for, for you uh, to share your experiences and your ideas with everybody today. Uh, I would also like to thank all the uh, technical team, my colleague Jasper and Magali's colleague Dora for having taken care of all the background work on this event so well. Uh, and I would like to thank, thank all the participants until a minute ago, so maybe it has something to do with me starting to speak, uh, but almost everybody who was there at the beginning of the event um, quite a few hours ago was still there. So I think that shows that the presentations have been interesting and relevant and I thank you for having taken part in, in what must have been a bit of a tiring or the informative morning. So I hope well, we will see many of you in the future activities of the project, starting with many of you taking part in the working groups tomorrow and others hopefully then uh, as we progress with the project. Uh, so I would like to uh, close the event uh, at this moment, uh, leaving um, you all for your remaining of your day and of your week and all the best of luck for dealing with higher education in these um, exceptional circumstances that we are still facing. So bye everybody. Thank you. <laughs>